Our sermon this morning is going to be on the false prophet and the false kingdom. Uh, that's something that's going to be set up before the coming of the Lord. Isn't that right? So let's uh, first talk about that Christ has a true kingdom. And this is very important because in America, they're pre preaching kingdom theology that the kingdom of Christ is actually on the earth and that they need to take over the government, which is what's going to usher in the Sunday laws. They actually believe this theologically and prophetically. But I want us to look at how Christ himself described his own true kingdom. Jesus said very clearly in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not what? It's not of this world. And then in Luke chapter 17, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't see it here, not physically. Neither shall they say, lo, it's here or lo, it's there. For behold, the kingdom of God is what? It's actually within you. It's actually within you. For the kingdom of God, Romans chapter 14, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but what? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. On this side of heaven, on this side of the second coming, the kingdom of God is not going to be a physical structure. It's not going to be something that's some geopolitical system. The kingdom of God is within his people, preparing them to live in the sight of a holy God and angels who have never fallen. Jesus often talked about his kingdom. In fact, when he says the kingdom of God is at hand, the people said, oh, finally, the Romans will be destroyed. We'll have better jobs, better food, right? That was their concept of the kingdom. But Jesus was going to explain his kingdom. And then the Sermon on the Mount is basically a description of what it means to be a citizen of heaven. To be a citizen of a heaven, you love your enemies. You bless them that curse you. You do good to them that hate you. If any man take away your coat, you let him have thy cloak also. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and do rust doth corrupt, but lay upon for yourselves treasures in heaven. And so the reason Jesus would so often talk about the kingdom is that he, he wanted them to overcome their erroneous concepts of a false kingdom, right? But he wanted them, so when the people said, oh, the kingdom isn't killing Romans, the kingdom is, oh, it's like this? Well, then I need to be like that, you see. So, you know, Jesus could have got up in front of a group of people. He could have just pointed out all their sins and say, what a terrible group of people you are. But instead he says, no, the kingdom of God is like this. And that way he was appealing to their heart. They could then see the sin in their heart because the kingdom's like this and they're living their life like this. And so he says, the kingdom's like this. And if you want to be part of the kingdom, this is what it's like. This is what it means to be a citizen of that kingdom. And Jesus would often even come out and say, especially in his parables, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in the field. Or the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and he sowed in his field. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole meal was leavened. Or again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. And the phrase I kept repeating is that it's the kingdom of, it's not the kingdom of earth. It's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, because you can't observe it here. Because the kingdom of God is within you to prepare you for the kingdom that's in, in heaven that will eventually, at the end of the thousand years, be on earth, on a, but a new earth. Where there's no more killing, there's no more hurt, there's no more pain, no more death. So in this world where there's pain and death and sorrow, the kingdom is not a geopolitical system here. In fact, prophetically, God told us that when Christ comes, he's going to destroy every what? Earthly kingdom. And so he tells us right in the prophecies to Daniel in this dream given to Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to see a man, this metallic image, a head of gold, Babylon, silver breast and arms, Medo-Persia, brass belly and thighs, Greece, legs of iron, Rome, the ten toes, the breakup of that Roman empire, the iron and clay, the iron and clay doesn't belong together any more than church and state belong together, and you got the papacy, and then the stone comes and it destroys what? The whole image. 
It doesn't matter what the government is. It doesn't matter if it's a monarchy or a republic or ecclesiastical power. Every one of them is destroyed because none of them are what? The kingdom of God. It's not a geopolitical system. And yet that's exactly what's being pushed today in America to bring about a Christian nation to take over all the governments of the world to enforce what? A Sunday law. It all begins with an erroneous concept. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. Here's a sequence of last day events. Just in the, in the Bible, mostly we read here in the book of Revelation, most of it, you, you have all the work we need to do until the close of probation. When the close of probation happens, what begins the fall? Seven last plagues. And then Christ returns with all his angels, right? That's the harvest. And he takes them back to heaven. The resurrected saints, saints are taken to heaven. Then there's the millennium, right? Saints are in heaven, the wicked are on the earth, and they're what? They're dead. They can't be deceived. But after the millennium, the wicked are raised to face judgment. The wicked are destroyed in the lake of fire. And then what happens? Then there's a new heaven, and then there's a new earth. And then you have the new Jerusalem here on this new made planet, and here will finally be what kingdom? The kingdom of God. will then finally be on planet Earth, but it's more than a thousand years away. And these guys are trying to push governments right now to have it right now to usher in the second coming. It's a very dangerous doctrine. Jesus warned us of these things, that there would be people who would deceive us concerning end time events because Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives and he looked down in Jerusalem he began to weep and he talked about how every stone would be uh, left unturned uh, the temple would be destroyed in the city right and the disciples then would ask him the question tell us when th shall these things be what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world they couldn't conceive of a world without a temple so if God's if God Jesus said the temple would be destroyed they thought that was the same as the coming of the Lord. They thought that would be the same as the end of the world. And so Jesus could really answer the question of the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world because they're parallel, or at least they're, they're similar, aren't they? And the first thing that Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 4, in answering the end of the world, is the first thing he tells them is do not be deceived because there's going to be a lot of deception about the end of the world. There's going to be a lot of deception about the coming of the Lord. But there's a truth about the coming of the Lord, and there is a truth, according to Bible scripture, about how the world will end. But there's a lot of error. Now, in chapter 24, Jesus would talk about that there'd be earthquakes once. There'd be wars and rumors of war once. But over and over again, he would tell us, don't be what? Deceived. Deceived. Verse 11 of chapter 24, many false prophets shall rise and what? Deceive many. We're living in deception time. And this is why we need truth. This is why we need all these avenues, first slide, publishing, leaves of autumn, autumn leaves, getting out literature, getting people to know the truth about what's really going to happen because most people believe what's not true about last day events. And we don't want them to be on the wrong side just because they have error. Most people think they're just going to be raptured out of the world so they don't have to face all this, at least the Christian community. It's an error. It's a terrible error. And then Jesus would say in verses 24 and 25 of the same chapter, answering the same question for the disciples, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets shall show great signs and wonders insomuch if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, before this all happens, you have been forewarned that there's going to be a lot of deception in the end of time. Now, here is a description of the false kingdom in the end of time. It's in Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, it's the description of the two superpowers that will exist in the end of time, of which the whole world will wonder after the one, and the second superpower will cause everybody to wonder and worship it. Now, there's other powers in the world, and God could talk about a lot of other powers, but he says, no, all I have to do is focus on these two, and I want you guys not to be worried about all, every thousand other things going on around the world. Doesn't mean they're not important, but you do got to keep your focus on this. 
You do got to keep your focus on these two superpowers because they're going to influence people's eternal destiny more than any other powers in the world. First beast, second beast. Okay? Now notice what the emphasis of these last day events are, this false kingdom. For he, this second beast, this second superpower, causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. And he, this second beast, he had the power. Wow, this is a powerful nation. He had power to give life unto the image of that first beast, that the image of the, that first beast should both speak legislatively and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. Well, you already know that's a false kingdom, don't you? Just by this description, they're going to set up a kingdom that's going to cause everybody to worship a certain way, but if you don't, they're going to kill you. Well, that's not Christ's kingdom. That's a false kingdom. So what's left up to us is find out, wow, who's the first beast and who's the second beast? But it goes on and says, and he, the second beast, causeth all, both small and great, great nations, small nations, rich and poor, rich nations, poor nations, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. That clearly is a false kingdom. And Jesus would even tell us in John 16, verse 2, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you, what? Think that he's doing God's service. What a deception. Wow. I'm going to kill you in the name of Jesus Christ. What a deception. You wonder, how do people get there? But we talked about neuroplasticity. You get these false thoughts and false impressions and false emotions, and you just keep tying them together and tying them together, and you throw in spiritualism at the same time, and people are just overwhelmed by their senses of false miracles and false wonders, fire coming down out of heaven with all the false information, not having prepared their souls, not having treated people like they'd want to be treated. And you've got end-time events, friends. How do we know it's a false kingdom besides what we've already read? Revelation 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that first beast, that first superpower, whose names are what? They're not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So the second beast, though they think their intentions are good, I'm not even questioning the intentions of the second beast. I just know that they don't understand where their efforts are tending. They think they're setting up Christ's kingdom. But what it's going to lead people to is the worship who? The beast and the dragon. And the dragon is, is Satan. Here's another way of knowing it's a false kingdom. Chapter 13, verse 4. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the first beast. And they worship the beast saying, who's like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him? So clearly, this is a false kingdom that's being pushed by the second beast. The second beast is causing all this. Oh, what a power in our world to be able to cause people not to be able to buy and sell, to have that kind of economic superiority in the world. To be a religiously oriented country to push a certain form of worship that you can even cause everybody to be killed. To have that influence over all other nations. Whew. <laughs> well, we could close and have uh, <laughs> our benediction right now. So, let's move on. Now, I, I want us to, to understand that the second beast and the false prophet have the same similar description. We just talked about the false kingdom. I want us to talk about the false prophet. Notice the description of the second beast again. And he doeth great wonders, Right? and deceiveth them to dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of that first beast, that first superpower, to receive a mark and to cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now I want you to notice now the description of the false prophet. It's the same description. Okay? And he, or and, that first beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. And what's the false prophet do? He wrought miracles before him, that first beast, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image, 
These both were cast alive in a lake of burning fire, or lake of fire burning with brimstone. So you know the first beast and the false prophet are false because they're going to wind up where? In the lake of fire. I mean, if they were true, they wouldn't be in a lake of fire. They'd receive eternal life. But the similarity between the second beast and the false prophet have the same description. But the second beast is a beast. It is a nation. A beast in Bible prophecy represents political power. But a false prophet has more of a religious tinge to it, doesn't it? And it's this false prophet within this great nation that's going to cause all this, that this great nation, this second beast, wouldn't do this if it wasn't for this false prophet. Pushing legislation. So let's go back. Okay, let's first talk about what a true prophet. So we've, there's going to be this false prophet, this false religious system. But let's talk about a true prophet. A true prophet is, is a spokesperson for God, right? They speak for God. Okay? So you see what Moses says here in Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, liken unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Because they're what? Speaking for God. God speaking to them to speak to us. Okay? That's how God raised up the prophets. And then you look at Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream so that he could do what? Share it with us. So God has had his prophets, right? And that's a true prophet. And here's some characteristics of a true prophet. Like Daniel, their predictions come to pass. Not 50% of the time, 100% of the time. They point people to God, not to themselves. They do not give their own private interpretation. They point out sin, but in a, a redemptive way because they want people to be saved. They warn of coming judgment so people are not lost. They are, they're warned so they have time to prepare because God loves them. They edify the church. Their messages harmonize with the Bible. They teach that Jesus came in fallen flesh. We know that from 1 John. They have a Christ-like character. They are obedient to the will of God. These are some of the evidences of a, a true prophet. But the false prophet, the false prophet actually thinks he's like a Moses. So when we're looking for someone who fits this mold in prophecy, we're not talking about someone who's got some mental health problems, right, and is in a hospital. We're talking about a religious organization that actually thinks they're like Moses, that they are, take themselves so seriously that God is speaking through them to tell the rest of the world what to do. That's a pretty serious position. You better have a humble heart and make sure that you're not a false prophet, right? You true prophet. But they think they're a person that's a, the spokesperson for God. However, the Bible calls them the false prophet. They are actually not speaking for God. But they think they are. And they're able to influence this second beast to commit atrocities that this second beast would never do. Except that these people present themselves as being so religious and so powerfully religious that they are like a spokesperson for God. You see that? So let's go back and read through Revelation 13, that false kingdom, and we'll put into the, the parentheses there the second beast as influenced by the false prophet. Now let's read this. And he, the second beast, as influenced by the false prophet, causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Because the reality is, this second beast, this superpower in our world, would not do this if it wasn't influenced by the false prophet. And he, the second beast, as influenced by the false prophet, had power to give life unto the image of that first beast, that the image of the first beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of that beast should be killed. The second beast wouldn't do this. The second beast would not kill people for not worshiping the first beast if it wasn't for the influence and the religious power and prowess of the false prophet. And he, the second beast, as influenced by the false prophet, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, 
and that no man, no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. And this doesn't happen unless there's this religious movement that takes themselves so seriously, has all these erroneous concepts about the kingdom of Christ that are, they have made political. The false prophet and the three unclean spirits. This is another way we know it's a false prophet. Look at the language here associated with the false prophet. And I saw three unclean spirits. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That would be bad, right? They're right off the bat. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of what? Devil. So this false prophet who thinks he's a prophet of God is really, really false. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So you, you have here, and we're going to come back to this, but you've got three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and the same three unclean spirits come out of the mouth of the beast, and the same three unclean spirits come out of the mouth of the prophet, and what we'll learn a little later, these are three unclean teachings that tie the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet together to lead the whole world to the battle of Armageddon. They don't agree on everything, but there's three main things they agree on that ties them together to try to wipe out God's people. When will the false prophet do these things? That's an important question. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. Through the power of the second beast, the false prophet, quote, causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound, past tense, was healed. So the second beast, influenced by the false prophet, can't cause all these things until what is healed first? The wound of the first beast. Now we're going to find out very soon that the first beast is what power? Is the papacy. Has the wound of the papacy begun to be healed already? Yes. yes. So since the beginning of that healing, then once that wound was beginning to be healed, then the second beast would come into the scene or the false prophet that would influence the second beast to cause all these things. So the reality is we're living in the end of time because the first beast has already had its healed, at least partially healed. All we're waiting for is for the false prophet to have enough political influence to influence the second beast, this superpower, to cause everybody to worship a certain way. We are already in last day prophetic times. So the first beast will not force people to worship the first beast until the first beast comes back to power. Okay, and notice the last paragraph. In addition, the false prophet could not cause the whole world to worship the first beast until the second beast is actually able to cause everybody to worship the first beast, right? And we're going to find out pretty soon that the second beast is which, which power? America. It's America. And there was a time in America where they could not cause the whole world to worship the first beast. Is that right? Yeah. So you have to have a time when the first beast has received its, has been healed of its deadly wound, at least partially, which is true already with Rome, and the second beast becomes powerful enough to actually be able to cause the whole world from being able to buy and sell. And we'll talk about that a little more if we have time. All of that is true today. So what's ultimately God waiting for? If all of it's true, if everything's set up, he's just waiting for us. He's waiting for us to be prepared to receive the seal of the living God, to receive the latter rain. That's all he's wait, waiting for. He's not waiting for the world to get worse. Who is the first beast? Well, the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 has long been identified as the Church of Rome by Bible scholars. John Wesley, Martin Luther, but two of the great Bible scholars. However, they are by no means the first ones who identified this or the last. 
And here's one identifying mark, a very important one that we remain faithful to, and that's Revelation 13, 5. There's many identifying marks of the papacy being the first beast of Revelation 13, but here's one that's undisputed. And there was given unto him the first beast a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Well, there's a lot of blasphemous types of powers and powers that have persecuted God's people, but there's only one that's done all that and ruled for exactly how long? 42 months. 42 months times 30 days in a month is 1,260 days. But in Bible prophecy, a day represents a year. And the papacy is the only power in earth's history that ever ruled for exactly 1,260 years. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to seem a little harsh, but I believe it with all my heart. How long was Jesus' ministry? How long is three and a half years? 1,260 days. So in Jesus' ministry of 1,260 days, he showed us in his ministry how the Father rules the universe in love and self-sacrifice. But God gave the devil 1,260 years to show us how he would have ruled the universe had he been in control. And all you have to do is look at those 1,260 years of the Dark Ages, and what do you see? You see 50 million plus people who were murdered because they refused to submit to the primacy of the Pope or to the, to the Mass. And that's exactly what would have happened to our beautiful little worlds out there that have never fallen. He would have destroyed them if they didn't bow down to him. But the papacy ruled from 538 to 1798. It's just a historical fact. Now, the beginning of the healing of the deadly wound, why we know we're in end time events, is that in 1929, the first beast of papacy regained political control over Vatican City. That 108.7 acres, they regained control. They became another, they became a beast. Now, they have always been a woman. A woman in Bible prophecy represents a church. Never in history did she cease to be a woman. She's always been a church, but she hasn't always been a beast. She never, a beast represents political power. She first gained political power in 538. She loses the political power in 1798. She's still a woman. She's still the church. She's just not a beast yet. But in 1929, she became a beast power again. She became a political power. She wasn't just a church anymore. She now has political status like all other nations. Isn't that right? In 1980, President Reagan sent an ambassador to the Vatican. President Truman tried to do that in 1950. But the Protestant world, or the Protestant America, rebelled and said, absolutely not. Truman was going to send General Clark to be the ambassador of the Vatican, and America was just in an uproar and said no, so he withdrew the nomination of Clark as the ambassador to the Vatican. It wasn't until 1980 that America was open enough to have an ambassador to the Vatican, and that came through Ronald Reagan. In the 1800s, there was such animosity between Catholics and Protestants. Usually, Protestant kids and Catholic kids didn't even play together. The animosity. In Protestant churches, you still talk, they still talked about the papacy being the antichrist of Bible prophecy. But when these false prophecies came in that are being preached today, the futurism, is when Protestants didn't think the papacy was the Antichrist anymore. They think it's some singular diabolical person in the end of time that's going to take over the world for seven years, see? Build a third temple in Jerusalem. And now that the papacy's not Antichrist, what are they doing now? Oh, they're clasping hands with Antichrist. But it still took decades. I mean, we're living in prophetic times because Revelation 13 didn't just tell us there'd be two superpowers in the end of time the Vatican and the United States, but that they would, they'd work together. Isn't that interesting? Prophetic, prophetic times. According to Bible prophecy, it is the second beast that fully restores the lost political power of the papacy because it says in Revelation 13, 12, and the second beast, of course, as influenced by the false prophet, exercise all the power of the first beast, the papacy, before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, the papacy, whose deadly wound was healed. It was already beginning to be healed, but to bring the papacy back to where she was at her height, it would be the, first, or the second beast, Protestant America. 
And it was the way the papacy started the first time. It was because of the strongest nation in Europe at the time, the French, the Franks, that began to fight the battles for the papacy, Clovis becoming the first Catholic king that allowed the papacy to come to power the first time by 538. And history is just simply repeating itself. So it was the first, most strongest nation in Europe that helped them come to power the first time, and to help them come to power the second time is the world's strongest nation. It's just history repeating itself. And he, the second beast, as influenced by the false prophet, had power to give life unto the image of the first beast, that the image of this first beast, the papacy, should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of that first beast should be killed. So the second beast is going to bring life to something. There's a lot of, lot of Protestants in America who have always believed in meshing church and state, and yet our Constitution talks about the separation of church and state. Just because our Constitution talks about separation doesn't mean people don't believe in church and state. They may simply disagree with the First Amendment. Okay? And so now you have this big push by these, these false prophet organizations, Christian organizations, talking about how we are a Christian nation. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but you know God's name's not even mentioned in our Constitution. God's not even mentioned in our Constitution. Religion's only mentioned twice, and we'll cover that in a little bit. But they don't believe that. They believe, no, we have to be a Christian nation. And we're going to look at some polling numbers, too. But what they're going to do, what this false prophet's going to do, they're going to bring life to the image of the beast. And what's the image of the beast? Well, it's the image of the first beast, the papacy. It's a likeness to the papacy when it ruled. Well, what did it look like when the papacy used to rule? How did it rule? It was able to rule over the conscience of men when the state did what? Enforced her decrees and dogmas and made them law and enforced them. And now she ruled over the conscience of men, both civilly and religiously. And that's the image. That's the image of the beast. And Protestants will give life to that. The false prophet gives life and makes it alive again, where it will be functioning, church and state together, okay? Now notice the intolerance of the false prophet. Oh, and he, the second beast, as influenced by this false prophet, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. I mean, these false religious leaders are so convinced of their kingdom building that you're going to have to submit one way or the other. You're going to have to take the mark either on the hand or on the forehead. And we're going to look at some of their statements. Neutrality will not be accepted. The word or. You'll have to receive the mark one way or the other as far as they're concerned. You're going to either take it on your hand or you're going to take it on your forehead, but there's no neutrality because neutrality would, would be to them treason against Jesus. I tell you, these guys believe this stuff. And they, are in, they have super political control in our country. Let's look a bit about history being repeated. Here's an interesting verse in Revelation 20, verse 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou suffereth that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself, God didn't call her a prophetess, she called herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Jezebel married King Ahab, right? King Ahab represented the state. Jezebel, this false prophetess, would represent religion. The two of them got to married together, which represents church and state, and what did they do? Persecuted the prophets of God. They persecuted God's people. That's the same as the papacy in the dark ages having the nation support her institutions and to enforce her decrees that anybody who disobeyed. Because once you have religious laws, what are laws meant for? To be enforced. So once you set up religious laws, somebody just lost their religious liberty. So in the end... It's going to be mostly Protestants pushing this, and we're going to see that here in a little bit. And he that leadeth into captivity. So now let's talk about the second beast. We've, we basically identified it as Protestant America, but let's see how the Bible 
helps us to make sure that this is this, the power that we've already mentioned. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. And I beheld another beast, another political power, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. The first thing we want to recognize about the second beast is that it is a political power. We're not looking at, at simply some religious institution. We're looking at a nation. Beasts represent political powers in Bible prophecy. But notice that it comes up out of the earth at a time when the first beast that had put people into captivity was itself going into captivity. The papacy that had killed by the sword was now being what? Killed by the sword. And as John was watching that, he saw another beast rising up out of the earth as the papacy itself was being killed by the sword who killed people by the sword. You see that? And when did the papacy receive its deadly wound? When did it go into captivity? When was it killed by the sword? 1798. So we're looking for a nation that arose around the time of 1798. And certainly in America, George Washington is the final years of his second term as president of the United States, our first president. So that fits, doesn't it? Now, there might be other nations you could put into that, but what other nations could you put into that formula that could cause the whole world to worship the first beast, right? But we need to make sure all of this fits. And I beheld another beast, this another political power, coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So let's pick out some of the detail. A lamb, what's a re lamb represent in Bible prophecy? It represents Jesus. So we're looking at a professedly Christian nation, not one constitutionally, as I just mentioned. We're not a Christian nation constitutionally. We are culturally, mostly, but not all people in our country are, are Christians. There are Muslims and Jews and other people of other faiths. But predominantly and historically, America has been predominantly what? Christian. But we're not constitutionally. But you are looking for a nation that is professedly Christian. But at the same time, it has two horns. But these aren't horns like on a bull. These are the horns of a lamb. These are horns represent power in Bible prophecy, but this is a docile use of power. It's not a, a coercive use of power like horns on a bull or Lauren, you know, the ferocious beast we see of, in prophecy. And so these two docile horns represent power the power that made people free, both civilly and religiously. This is what had made America great. Okay? Now notice also that the first beast, it says in verse 1, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. But the second beast, I beheld another beast, and it came up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And so the first beast of papacy rose out of, up out of the sea in the old world with its teeming multitudes, because seas or waters represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, Revelation 17, 15. So if seas and waters represent a place where there's many, many people, teemings, numbers of people, then the earth would represent just the opposite of that, a place where there's very few people. So what nation would have risen up around 1798, professedly Christian, coming out of a part of the world where there's very few people? that would have, the, have a lamb-like features with the two horns of civil and religious liberty. It is clearly the United States, isn't it? So here's that, here's that uh, summary again. It arose around the time the papacy received its deadly wound. That's true. It is a professedly Christian nation, but not constitutionally. That's true. Its con constitution is based on civil and religious liberty, the two horns. That's true. It arose out of the new world. It is able to cause the whole world to worship the first beast, and it's able to force uh, economic sanctions on the world. For example, do you remember when Trump, uh, not too long ago, uh, was wanting to push Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, and nations that did not vote with us, their names were written down, and they may not get any more funding because the United States has that kind of economic power, 28% of the world's economic power, okay? Where do we find the false prophet? Well, if the second beast is the United States, then the false prophet is an apostate religious power predominantly within the United States. 
Its influence is going to be felt worldwide, but her headquarters, the main base of her support, is U.S. Have we been warned of this? Think of some of the things said by our Lord's servant. When the leading churches of the United States, and when we have churches plural, we're probably predominantly talking about what kind of churches? Protestant churches. When the leading churches of the United States, upon uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, they don't agree with everybody, but certain things in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will, form, will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will, invent, will inevitably result. Now, this was written well over 100 years ago. This was written in a time where Catholic children and Protestant children didn't play together. This was at a time when you still have Protestants calling the Catholic Church the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. And imagine writing that when that's not what people are currently believing. And now, it's all coming true right before our eyes. This is a fulfillment. We have been forewarned that this is exactly what's going to happen, which we just went over the prophecies. They're saying the exact same thing. Last day events, page 134. When Protestant churches shall unite with a secular power to sustain a false religion, right? To set up a false kingdom, right? There will be a national apostasy which will only lead in national ruin. Notice the emphasis. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. As America, the land of religious liberty, the two horns, right, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling man to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. It's exactly what the prophecies tell us. Notice the emphasis here. Last day events. Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power. The professed Protestant world will form a confederacy with the man of sin. Romanism in the old world, what? Apostate Protestantism in the new. Then, Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power. And this is why God says, there's two evil powers in the world. Not one, not just Rome. We can't just focus on Rome. We've got to be watching what's happening in America amongst who? The Protestant churches. Because they're the false prophet who's going to influence the second beast to cause all these atrocities. Which leads people to worship the first beast. Look at this religious intolerance. Causes the earth. This is a second beast who's mostly who? What churches? Protestant churches causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first, causing that as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Wow, what a false religion. Causeth all to receive a mark and that no man might buy or sell. That includes women and children. What has happened to their thinking? Save he that had the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Listen to the, with this, and I'm going to talk to you a lot about not just evangelicals. I'm going to now get into the news. But a lot of these people are what I call dominionists. They, they are called dominionists. A dominionist is a person, it's a type of Christianity in America, that believes they're supposed to control the government. If you would get on the internet and you look up dominionists and government, dominionists and Congress, dominionists and seven mountains, you'll find that they believe that they have the orders from God to control the seven mountains, which includes government, family, media, business, entertainment, all of that. They are supposed to control everything, and they honestly believe that as soon as they control all of that, then Christ will come. That is an awfully strong or terrible, dangerous doctrine. 
And it's not so dangerous to us if it's some guy sitting in a mental hospital. But when it's a false religion that is so powerful, so political, that they've already gained the inner circle of the President of the United States, you know you're in end time events. Listen to what this one person said. Ministry, Protestant America. I want, to, I want you to just let a wave of intolerance wash over you. I want you to let a wave. He's saying this to a group of evangelicals. I want you to let a wave of hatred wash over you. Yes, hate is good. Our goal is a Christian nation. I mean, right there's a contradiction, right? <laughs> and how people still sit there, I have no idea. We have a biblical duty. We are called on by God to conquer this nation. We don't want equal time. We don't want pluralism. That means they're going to make everybody to take the mark of the beast either on the hand or the forehead, and there's no neutrality. And if we oppose it, which we will be pro proclaiming the Sabbath more fully, we'll be actually in opposition to this. But what a privilege to proclaim the truths of God's word in this opposition with that peace in our heart, knowing that we're going to actually rescue some of the people who are caught up in this falsity. And to know that they'll be in heaven. They'll go from the wrong side to the right side. Gary North, one of the movement's ideological founders, made this clear, clear, goal clear. A biblical, based society, political, and religious order, which finally denies the religious liberty of the enemies of God. Mark of the beast. You have to take it. No neutrality. In a public policy polling survey released on February 24th, 2015, so we're 2015, an astonishing 57% of Republicans. Now, the Republican Party is the one who stands up more on the side of moral issues against abortion and same-sex marriage, and yet look what the devil's doing to influence the minds of these people that we would have a lot of agreement with culturally. 57% of these people, and it's growing, this is just 2015, favor abandoning the Constitution of the United States in favor of having a Christian nation. Do you know how dangerous that is? We just read out that they will trample every principle of our Constitution, and you've got 57% of Republicans. Go ahead, wipe it out. We want a Christian nation. We want Sunday laws. Only 30% of Republicans are opposed. Most Democrats would be opposed, and that's the more progressive, liberal, political entity in our country. But see, we can't side with either one. You know, in Ellen White's time, she was part of the temperance movement. The women's temperance movement was not an Adventist movement, but they joined together and worked with them together until the women's temperance movement joined with the Sunday law movement. And it's like, oh, well, we can't work with them anymore because... They're pushing for something that's going to bring persecution to the world. And you know, friends, we may agree with Republicans on things, but you can't become part of the party because what are they doing? They're all part of going to push Sunday laws. So that means that we're on our own. We don't have, we shouldn't have a political affiliations. You are a Seventh-day Adventist Christian in the last moments of Earth's history, and we have a work to do to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. Take a stand for moral issues. But don't be a political party person, okay? Religious liberty, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law, no law, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The other place where religions mention our Constitution only twice is Article 6. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any public office or public trust under the United States, which means a Muslim can run for public office as much as a Christian or a person who professes no religion at all. It's not a test. The only two times religion is even mentioned in the United States Constitution, and God's not mentioned once, in respect to Christianity. 
Because by having separation of church and state and freedom of conscience, that means that Christianity and all other religions would have the freedom to teach what they believe, and our founding fathers believed that in that freedom, Christianity would prove that it's the true religion, not by forcing its religion on people, but by in a free and open debate, we could uplift Jesus Christ and see lives change. That's how Christianity is to be spread. Because the only way to change the human heart is not by legislation. Only the gospel can change the heart of a sinner. We know the intent of the First Amendment because during the these Senate journals where they were, they were in secret and it was all written down, all these proposals. And a proposal was made by Charles Pickney. He was a delegate from South Carolina. And he said this, the legislature of the United States shall pass no law on the subject of religion. And he made a proposal for the First Amendment just almost verbatim to that. The Congress shall pass no law touching the subject of religion. And you know, in that committee, they passed it. That was the intent, but it wasn't the final wording but it gave you the intent that Congress can pass no law even touching the subject of religion. That's our Constitution. In fact, even without the First Amendment, Congress can't legally pass religious legislation because Congress or the Constitution doesn't give them the power to do so. And any powers not given to Congress are powers that Congress can't utilize, right? Can't act on. If you're not given power in the Constitution as a Congress, you can't enact on them. You can only use the powers that have been given to you. And no power was ever given to Congress to pass religious legislation. George Washington, our first president, every man who conducts himself as a good citizen and is accountable alone to God for his religious faith and should be protected in worshiping God according to the dictates of his own conscience. The North Carolina Constitution of 1776, that all men have a natural and unalienable right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience. You see, we can have moral laws in America. You see, the First Amendment says that Congress shall pass no law respecting the establishment of what? Religion, not morality. We can have moral laws because moral laws has to do with man's relationship with his fellow man. You can't murder your fellow man. You can't steal from him. See, we can have moral laws. You just can't have religious laws because religion has to do with a person's relationship with God. You can't have laws that tell people who to worship, when to worship, which place to worship, what mode of worship. But you can have moral laws. You can have laws against abortion or same-sex marriage. Or, these are moral laws. These aren't religious laws. You just can't have religious laws. But what's a Sunday law? That's a religious law. That directly interferes with man's relationship with with God. And our relationship with God preceded every earthly government. Adam and Eve had a relationship with God before there ever was a human government. Our relationship with God will always precede the power of the state. Okay? Dominion theologies, these dominionists I talked about, this is, I'm quoting them here. Dominion theology, this is their words, dominion theology is predicated upon three basic beliefs. One, Satan usurped man's dominion over the earth through the temptation of Adam and Eve. Two, the church is God's instrument to take dominion back from Satan. Three, Jesus cannot or will not return until the church has taken dominion by gaining control of the earth's governmental and social institutions. That's exactly what Revelation 13 is about, isn't it? Causing all, both small and great, all governments. This is what these guys believe. But the opposite's going to happen. They're going to take over the governments of the world. They're going to enforce a religion, and it won't usher in the second coming for people to worship Jesus. They're going to wind up worshiping who? They're going to wind up worshiping Satan. I'm quoting them here. The kingdom of God was inaugurated and the king was installed and seated in the first century AD and we need not wait for the king's second coming to get the kingdom started here on earth. At this moment of history, all humans on earth, whether Jew or Gentile, believer or unbeliever, private person or public official, are obligated to bow their knees to this King Jesus Confess him as Lord of the universe with their tongues and submit to his lordship over every aspect of their lives in thought, word, and deed. 
Five biblical evangelism according to the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, is not truly accomplished unless that message of Christ's lordship from point four above is given to the person being evangelized so that they know that an attempt at personal neutrality before King Jesus is sin and treason in this universe. Do you know what Ellen White says they'll call us here in the end of time? They'll call us the enemies of the state. That would be treason. This is in their own literature. This is what they preach in front of these evangelical churches. People are buying this stuff up. Yeah, we've got to take over government. We've got to take over City Hall. But this is why God initially why raised us up, not to be political, to prepare people for the true coming of the Lord and the true kingdom of heaven. That's why we've been raised up. Potent means President of the United States, but there's a group called POTUS Shield. POTUS Shield is a group of Pentecostal leaders devoted to helping President Donald Trump bring about the reign of God across the country and the world. Many of the prophets and apostles, and that's what they call themselves, I'm, you know, taking part in POTUS Shield are part of the fastest growing form of Christianity. This is just a handful of the huge organization, Christian organizations and so forth in the United States the Family Research Council, the Freedom Federation, the Council for National Policy, the Council on Foreign Relations, the New Apostolic Reformation, Campus Crusade for Christ, Youth with a Mission, the Christian Coalition, are all part of this dominion theology. It is so huge, friends. We can't point to one ministry. It's the predominance of all the main ministries in the United States. Dominionists running for president. Dominion, dominionism now appears to be a permanent feature of politics at the levels, at all levels. For three presidential elections in a row, dominionist politicians have played prominent roles, following Mike Huckabee and Sarah Palin in 2008, Michelle Bachman and Rick Perry in 2012, and the remarkable run of Ted Cruz in 2016. Dominionists are amongst the most prominent politicians in the country and enjoy significant political support and acceptance as a legitimate part of the political mix. Wow, I'm running out of time. These are prominent dominionists. I want you to think in terms of these people in relation to Donald Trump. They're all dominionists. Kellyanne Conway is currently serving as counselor to the president and was probably the, the most popular face of his political primary run, right? I mean, Kellyanne Conway, spokesperson. Steve Bannon ran his campaign. He's a dominionist. Rick Perry, Secretary of Energy, Dominionist. Elizabeth D. DeVos, Dominionist, Secretary of Education. Mike Pence, Evangelical Catholic Dominionist, Vice President of the United States. Paula White, Dominionist, Pentecostal, Spiritual Advisor to Donald Trump. Donald Trump's inner circle is predominantly Dominionist, which is why Donald Trump talked about Jerusalem becoming the capital of Israel, and you start wondering, now, why would someone who has Trump vodka, Trump hotels, Trump casinos, have this religious interest in Jerusalem being the capital of Israel? Well, he doesn't personally. The dominionists believe this because they believe for Jesus to return, number one, Israel had to become a state. Number two, they got to own Jerusalem. And number three, they're going to build a third temple. This is all part of their prophetic belief. And so they're preempting all these things. And we know what's scary, friends? They're trying to preempt the Battle of Armageddon, which they believe is a military battle. Over a year ago, the people in Trump's inner circle that are dominionists have already contacted the Pentagon about invading Iraq or Iran. And in their belief, that's preempting a Battle of Armageddon. These guys are serious about this. And the reason they're not scared of preempting a war, because prophetically, they know they can't lose that they would win in their thinking, in their belief system. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, these three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the same three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the beast, and the three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the false prophet, are, I believe, three unclean teachings. Notice this in 1 John 4, 1. 
Beloved, not, do not believe every spirit or believe not every spirit. Don't believe everything you hear. But try the spirits, try these teachings, try the things that you hear, whether they're of God. Because what? Many false prophets are gone out into the world. So when you look at these three unclean spirits coming out of their mouth, they're speaking. And when you speak, it's coming from your heart. It's what you believe. And these are three unclean spirits, are three unclean teachings. And Sister White already told us what two of them are. What are they? Spiritualism and Sunday sacredness. So if the dragon is spiritualism, the beast is Catholicism, and the false prophet is apostate Protestantism, do all three of them believe in spiritualism? They all believe in the immortality of the soul. Do they believe in Sunday sacredness? Yes. But there's a third unclean teaching that's going to drive them together. And that three, un three the th now let's just notice real quickly the three unclean teachings that are always brought up. We don't have to guess what the three unclean teachings are. The Bible will tell us. We don't have to guess. Notice how these three are always mentioned together in Revelation. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped, number one, the beast, neither his image, neither he received his mark. Those three. Notice again, Revelation 14. If any man worship the beast, number one, his image, number two, and receive his mark, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You see how that works? Revelation 13, cause of the earth to what? Worship the beast. Cause as many as would not worship the two, number the image of beast, or to receive the mark of the beast. So if we would equate spiritualism with the worship of the beast, worshiping a creature, and certainly the mark of the beast is Sunday sacredness, that leaves us with the third unclean teaching, the image of the beast. And this is what the world is now being indoctrinated with. That to bring the world closer to God, back to God, you have to mesh what? Church and state. And that's exactly what's being preached in this dominion theology to get all the evangelicals, all these Protestant churches to then go past a religious institution Sunday. Because now they believe in the uniting of church and state and no longer believe in the separation of church and state. That's the times in which we live. And let's close with these couple statements. The movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages of the church the support of the state. You notice the church state image of the beast here? Protestants are falling in the steps of papists. Nay, more. They are opening the door for the papacy to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she has lost in the old world. And that's which gives greater significance to this movement is the fact that the principal object contemplated is the enforcement of the Sunday observance, a custom which originated with Rome and which she claims as a sign of her authority. So for many, many centuries, Catholics and Protestants have believed in Sunday. They've believed in the immortality of the soul. But you know what they have to believe in also? for all this to happen? Meshing church and state. That's dominionist theology. The dominionists are the inner circle of Donald Trump's administration. We're here, friends. End time event, all the players are in place. The mentality that the people have of pushing a Sunday law, they're already in power. What's God waiting for? He's just waiting for us. He wants us to get more visibility, right? First light. Educating people. More books in the homes. That people will read the truth. What's that mean for us? We support these ministries. We do all we can to buy literature. We start sharing it with people. We try to get it in the homes because we don't want people what? We don't want them to just be deceived. We don't want them to be lost. We don't want them to believe in this, this false education going around about meshing church and state. We want them to know the truth about what happens when a man dies. We want them to understand the beauties of the resurrection. We want them to understand the beauty of the Sabbath. And we want them to understand the beauty of religious liberty. That there would be toleration, freedom for everybody to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. And this is why we're a unique animal in the world. I can agree with some things by the Democrats and I can agree with some things by the Republicans. But I still have to stand as a Seventh-day Adventist. 
and just preach the truth because if you don't preach the truth, people are going to be lost. And we want people to live forever. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we can see that you've not only given us a beautiful set of doctrines to protect us from errors theologically, but Father, you have placed in our heart even this, this spirit of freedom, a spirit of love that will allow us to reach across the gulf to reach people with the gospel, not to reach across the gulf to grasp the hands of the Roman power. We are clearly going in a different direction than the Protestant world. And the Church of Rome has long gone along the wrong course over a millennia ago. Oh, Father, we pray because we know most of your people are within the communion of these Protestant churches and there are many beautiful, beautiful Catholic people who themselves will come out and join the ranks of God's people. But help each one of us, Father, to embrace truth, to share truth, and to be searchers of truth. And Father, we thank you that you have brought us here together to study many things. We're thankful for those listening on First Light who may be listening for the first time and we're so excited that they are our brothers and sisters now to go forth in faith, to share a beautiful truth to rescue people from being lost. So Father, as we come to a close of these meetings, we want to give you the praise how you have brought us here together. We want to praise you for the work you've done in each one of our hearts, how you have brought each one of us to the foot of the cross. And we thank you for all the ground we will gain from this day forward, all by thy grace. In this we pray, in the precious name of Jesus, amen.